Okay, in this video, we are going to look into a radio platform other than LoRa. Now, LoRa is pretty popular. It stands for Long Range, and I've built many projects using LoRa. It runs on the ISM band, which is license-free, and it uses chirp modulation. Now, the radios we're going to look at are these radios here. Now, these are spread spectrum radios. Now, there's two types of spread spectrum radios. There's direct sequence, and there's frequency hopping. And these are the frequency hopping type. Now these are made by eByte, they're the E34 series, and the part number is 2G4H27D. Now the 2G4 stands for 2.4 GHz, that's the ISM band which is license free, and the 27D stands for 27 dBm output which is one half watt. So the frequency range of these radios are 2.4 GHz to 2.518 GHz, and they draw about 400 milliamps on transmit, and they have an advertised range of 5 kilometers, or about 3 miles, with a visual line of sight between the antennas and a radio line of sight with clear Fresnel zones. Now the setup I have here is, is not very ideal. I have two radios with their antennas on in close proximity and they're transmitting 2.4 gigahertz at a half a watt which is pretty powerful. So we could get some unpredictable results because that RF field that strong could actually randomly turn on transistors which could cause a lot of problem. Okay I have a little demo circuit on my breadboard to demonstrate how a strong RF signal can activate a transistor. So I have a transistor on my breadboard, it's an NPN transistor, it's connected up to this LED, and the base of the transistor has a resistor from the base to ground, so I'm actually shorting out the base of the transistor. And I have a radio, I have a 5 watt portable radio, and I'll put the antenna close to the transistor, and I'll transmit, I'll key up the radio, you can see the LED comes on every time I key up the radio. So the strong RF electromagnetic field is inducing current actually in the base circuit and activating the transistor which is turning on the LED. Okay, I have replaced my radio antennas with 50 ohm dummy loads so now I don't have to worry about strong RF fields corrupting any of my circuitry because a strong RF field could corrupt my FTDI module or my switching regulator. This, this is a direct replacement for a 7805 so if you don't have any dummy loads, you could turn down the RF power and then separate the two boards with a little bit of distance. Now these dummy loads leak a little bit, so they'll still transmit and receive between the two modules. So all I have to do is hook up USB port into my computer, running a serial terminal program, and I could send data between the two modules. So we'll have a look at the schematic of one of these test boards, which you could build. It has a mode switch for uh, going into program mode or normal mode, a 5 volt regulator and an FTDI module. Okay, here's the schematic diagram of the circuit that I built on my breadboard for testing and development of the E34 eByte spread spectrum frequency hopping radio module. Now this schematic might look familiar to some of you because if you look at the seven pins along the front of the module, it's the same pinout as the LoRa E32 modules. So if you have an E32 LoRa project and you want to go from a lower platform to a spread spectrum platform you can just drop in this module even the software is compatible so I have my two mode switches my M0 and M1 and they're powered by 3.3 volts coming off the FTDI module so you jumper the FTDI module for 3.3 volts and that's powering the input to the M0 and M1 inputs now the TX and RX from the FTDI feed the TX and RX of the E34 module and they're a 3.3 volt level UART. So you plug in the USB connector into the computer, into your computer, and you run TerraTerm and you can send data into the UART of the module, which will be transmitted out to the antenna. Now you power the module with 5 volts and you need a good clean power supply because on transmit it draws 400 milliamps. Now the auxiliary output is driving this transistor, which is driving this auxiliary LED, which indicates when the E34 module is busy and the status of the data buffer. Okay, next, we are going to look into why you would want to change from a LoRa radio platform to a spread spectrum radio platform, and I'll go through some reasons. So this is a frequency hopping system. It has 12 hopping channels from 2.412 GHz to 2.423 GHz, and it hops in a pseudo-random pattern. Now as it's sending data, it's hopping on these 12 channels, but the receiver knows the pseudo-random pattern, so it's tracking it. So if there's any single frequency interference, 
it will actually hop around it and get the data to the receiver. Because there's a lot of competition in 2.4 gigahertz ISM band. We've got Wi-Fi, you got Bluetooth, you got microwave ovens. And every time the transmitter sends a packet to the receiver, the receiver will actually transmit an act back, an acknowledgement back saying he's got the packet intact. And if the transmitter doesn't get an act back, it will actually try 16 more times. Now the biggest thing is speed. Now the LoRa radio modules, the maximum speed was 19.2 kilobits per second over the air data rate. Now this system is 250 kilobits per second minimum to 2 megabits per second maximum. So it's a higher speed because we're running at a higher frequency, 2.4 gigahertz. Now the modulation in the LoRa radio module is chirp modulation, but the modulation in this frequency hopping uh, system is FSK, frequency shift keying. It's actually GFSK, Gaussian frequency shift keying. So what it does is shifts the carrier frequency above and below the center frequency to get our data stream. Okay, the modulation scheme that we are using is FSK, frequency shift keying. It's actually called GFSK, Gaussian frequency shift keying. So this is how we encode our digital ones and zeros in our bit stream over the radio. So here's our center frequency of our radio, say it's a 2.4 gigahertz. Now if we want to encode a digital one, we go in one direction, say we go up, so we shift up, and that's a digital one. And if we want a digital zero, we go down, we shift down, and that's a digital zero. So this is our bit stream, so when we go up to a digital one, it will shift up our frequency, and we go down to a digital zero, it will shift down our frequency. And we have one problem with this, when we're shifting with a square wave we're shifting instantaneously from a center frequency up and a center frequency down and when we do that we create a lot of sidebands and that will exceed our maximum allowable bandwidth so what we do we put this data stream of square waves through a Gaussian filter it's basically a low pass filter so here's a step voltage through a Gaussian filter that will be your output so it smooths the output so that the change between the center and, and up and center and down is, is smooth, it's not instantaneously. So that will that will decrease our bandwidth of our of our signal. Okay, here's a spectrum display of a carrier at 915 megahertz. Now this is a clean carrier, there's no modulation present. So next I'm gonna modulate it with a sine wave. You can see it's being modulated with a sine wave, and the bandwidth is still within specs. If we had emission testing, this would pass. So next I'm gonna modulate this carrier with a square wave. You can see the bandwidth has increased. We have sidebands now on the left and right of the carrier. So this would cause interference in neighboring channels. So this would not pass a test, an emissions test. So if you had a product and you modulate it with a square wave, this would not pass. So next, we're going to take this signal, this square wave, and pass it through a Gaussian filter. And then we'll see what the output looks like. Okay, we have passed our square wave data through a Gaussian filter, and this is our spectrum output. So it's pretty clean. There's no excessive sidebands on the left and right of the carrier. So this would pass our emissions test. Okay, I have the programming software up and running on my computer from eByte to program the E34 radio modules. So in here we could set the UART data rate. I have it set for 9600 bits per second but we could go from 1200 bits per second all the way up to 115.2k bits per second. Parity is 8N1 over the air data rate. Minimum is 250 kilobits per second. We could go all the way up to 2 megabits per second. Power output, that's our RF power output, is 27 dBm. That's a half a watt. We could take it down to 9 dBm. I.O. mode is in push-pull, or we could go open drain. That's for our M0, M1, and our TX and RX pins. Fixed mode is disabled, so it's in transparent mode. So anytime we send data into the UART, into the buffer, it will transmit automatically until the buffer is empty. And we could enable that fixed mode, so we could do point to point and point to multipoint. My resend time is 15. I think previously I said 16, but it's 15. That's our ACK. So if it sends a packet and it doesn't get an ACK back, it will try 15 more times. So what I have to do is set set parameters and do OK, and we're good to go. OK, after we have configured our E34 module the way we want it to, we could plug it into a breadboard and hook it up to our favorite microcontroller. Now the GPIO lines of the microcontroller can control the M0 and M1 lines, the mode lines, so we could, we could actually activate the modes by software. 
And the serial port of our microcontroller, TX and RX lines, are hooked up to the UART of the E34 module so we can send data back and forth over the air. So this is a little primer, how we could go from a LoRa radio platform to a sped spectrum frequency hopping platform.